Well, okay, so first, um, I want to thank the organizers for this great chance to talk about my um, this small research project. Um, I will start with an anecdote um, describing the nature of East-West artistic connections. This is also a true story from the early Brezhnev era, when Western art was hardly any more completely alien in the Soviet Union. So, one curator from the State Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Eremitage, was in New York's Museum of Modern Art, helping to unload paintings that were loaned to the United States from Eremitage. In a friendly manner, American museum staff asked their Soviet visitor if she would like to see museum collections that were in the reserve. They started with pictures they thought would be most familiar to their visitor. But she interrupted after a few screens. Why are you showing me these? I don't want to see them. Her host then replied, what would you like to see then? Um, she paused for a moment and then she asked if museum had anything of the Pope. Her host mumbled in a puzzled tone, paintings of the Pope. She went on, when I was in Amsterdam, I saw paintings of the Pope, which were lent by your museum. Host asked if she meant paintings by Francis Bacon. This didn't evoke any response. However, still trying to get access to her host, she repeated, you know, Pope, a Pope. Um, <clears throat> Suddenly, a gong went off in her host's head. Do you mean pop painting, like P-O-P? -P? Oh, she said, somewhat embarrassed. You know, we never say or hear the word. I have only read it in the magazines, so I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. As her host led uh, her to her screen where the Wesselman's mouth was hanging, she shook her head, yes, yes. Indeed, this short anecdote is quite telling about how the contemporary Western art was perceived in the Soviet Union. Information could be obtained, yet it was not publicly discussed. Western art currents could be followed through magazines, in occasional discussion with foreigners, but the modern Western art rarely found its way to the Soviet Union, nor was it easily accessible to broad audiences. In the following presentation, I, my aim is not as much to investigate what kind of uh, influences flowed from East to West, but rather make a quick look at the nature of connections between Eastern and Western artistic worlds. I will discuss why East-West artistic connections were so few when compared to music, for example, and why large-scale exchange projects eventually failed. Finally, I will look at the implications of this failure, since, I will argue, this led to the creation of extensive transnational extra-governmental networks between individuals and professionals. Nikita Khrushchev's period at the helm of the Soviet Union, or part of it, is often called the Thaw. Mainly referring to years from 1956 to uh, 1962, this period included forceful destalinization, especially dismantling of physical terror, but also liberalization of culture and mass media. This period has been examined often as an inner process, something taking place inside the Soviet Union. The thaw, however, significantly altered the Soviet position in the world scene. Recently, there have emerged uh, works evaluating Soviet interaction with the surrounding capitalist world and implications of these connections. Indeed, if we compare it to the preceding Stalinist era, the, the Thor, saw, um, Thor period saw a drastic opening to the West, with selected members of cultural and artistic intelligentsia being allowed access to Western countries, to their colleagues in the West, and to Western artistic currents. Uh, while during the Stalin era, foreign influences and all kinds of connections were suppressed to a minimum, I argue that artistic connections that emerged after Stalin's death were more voluminous and less propaganda-centered than has sometimes been presented. I will deal with one particular case to describe the Soviet willingness for cultural exchange, limits and implications of such exchanges, and finally, how these operations allowed for the emergence of transnational networks, informal connections between Soviet and Western individuals that were far from the original Soviet objectives. By starting from the broader East-West um, context of East-West exchanges and how they came to be, I aim at pointing out how the changes were not similar in different arts. <clears throat> What was similar for each art form, however, was that prominent individuals were involved on both sides, making these early connections particularly interesting. 
My chosen case deals with Soviet American connections in the fine art. This case twines around Alfred H. Barr Jr., one of the most influential non-artists in the world of modern art, but also to his organization, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I won't go deep into Barr's persona, and there are certainly people who know Barr far better than I do, but rather I will use his work and operations as examples of the changes in the Soviet attitude towards the West, about East-West artistic exchanges, as well as formation and functioning of transnational networks during the post-Stalin era. Barr is known mainly as a missionary for modern arts and for his work to popularize abstract arts. But he also visited the Soviet Union a few times, and when it became possible, was in correspondence with several of his Soviet colleagues. He was particularly active uh, in arranging an exchange of art exhibitions between American and Soviet art museums in the 1950s, highly ambitious project that will be discussed in the presentation. But before we uh, dive deep into these transnational artistic networks, we need to discuss briefly the framework that made such projects possible in the first place. After the Second World War, foreign policy in the democratically governed countries became increasingly dependent on the popular opinion. This increased electorate's relevance for the international relations. Uh, this increased electorate's relevance for the international relations substan substantially. Soviet leadership saw a chance to use this feature it considered to be a central weakness in Western democracies. By culturally influencing foreign population, it aimed at having electorates to press their respective governments to become more compliant towards Soviet objectives. Although the Soviet Union had for a long time influence on foreign communists, these measures were now directed to growing middle classes in order to make a real change. This change became apparent only after Stalin's death. Thus far, borders remained closed apart from very few carefully selected individuals whose presence in the West was considered absolutely necessary. In this respect, mid-1950s was the period of drastic change in many respects. Until Stalin died in 1953, arts had been kept strictly away from foreign influences. Apart from few major international exhibitions and musical competitions, Soviet Union did not send artists abroad, nor were works of art exchanged with Western governments. In retrospect, the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party itself stated that there were practically no cultural relations with the US government before 1955. Only tours in the Soviet Union of Paul Robeson and Yehudi Menyukhin were then mentioned as exceptions. Then, suddenly, in mid-50s, Soviet musicians and dancers started to tour in the West. Furthermore, this meant not only individuals, but in some cases whole opera houses were sp uh, spent months touring the capitalist countries. Although music and dance led cultural exchanges, other kind of exchanges and delegations and people soon followed. The change was reflected in the Communist Party bureaucracy too. During the Stalin era, the Organization for Overseas Cultural Connections was called VOX, V O K S. In 1957, this organization was terminated and replaced by two different structures. The first and the more visible was NGO styled SSOD, Union of Friendship Societies. The other organization was perhaps even more important. New State Committee for Cultural Ties with Foreign Countries, abbreviated GKKS, assumed powers not only from Vox, but from the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Culture, among others. Throughout the Khrushchev era, this committee exercised wide powers uh, over cultural exchanges and uh, of artistic connections to foreign countries. It took care of much of the foreign propaganda, but also controlled uh, uh, parts of the foreign travel, closely coordinating with other parts of the government and party organs. Although GKKS was not the origin of the expansion of Soviet foreign connections and operation, its establishment is illustrative of the importance placed on these actions by the Soviet government and Khrushchev personally. Head of GKKS, Yuri Zhukov, became a man of importance who facilitated signing of exchange plans with many countries, although often in the background. Zhukov seems to have been a reformer among Soviet bureaucracy, if we use the oversimplified dichotomy of neo-Stalinist and reformists. Temporary victory of reformists over neo-Stalinists around 1956 and 57 was thus reflected to artistic connections of the Iron Curtain too. GKKS 
GKKS's actions were less aggressive and went along crucial ideas about openly competing with, but also learning from the West. This led to mutual exchange of artists, students, professional and tourist groups, but also to exchange of printed matters and cultural artifacts. One US contemporary described aptly that Soviet cultural diplomacy was systematic exploitation of cultural material, symbols, persons, and ideas in reaching their foreign political objectives. Indeed, as the Soviet Union signed agreements of bilateral cultural exchange in the latter half of the 1950s with most capitalist countries, US in late 1957, these were Soviet initiatives. Agreements were often left fairly open without strict definitions about cooperation in order to prevent their Western counterparts from controlling their actions too tightly. Furthermore, instead of capitalist governments, Soviet government preferred to deal with prominent individuals and private actors in the West. This well applies both to the Museum of Modern Art in New York and Alfred Barr. This framework of cultural exchange is an important one. Even if Soviet cultural operations were just concealed attempts to influence foreign populations for the Communist Party, their meaning was different for Soviet individuals. And furthermore, they made it possible for transnational networks to emerge in the post-Stalin era. Instead of few highly placed diplomats, these exchanges gave many Soviet intellectuals an access to foreign countries. Furthermore, through traveling of foreigners into the Soviet Union, even those who were not allowed to travel outside the Soviet Union got access to foreign currents, information, and sometimes became involved in transnational networks. All this is present in the case of Alfred Barr. The chains of Soviet policies after Stalin, expansion of cultural exchanges, their limitations, and finally, transnational networks. Alfred Barr was a protagonist of abstract art in the first place. His What is Modern Painting, originally from 1943, is among the most influential works on popularization of abstract art. This work was primarily educational, meant to familiarize broad audiences with modern art. He was also the first director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York that was established in 1929. At MoMA, he had seemingly little interest towards the Soviet Union as it appeared to be closed and isolated society, out of reach for Westerners until the mid-1950s. He had, however, made a trip to the Soviet Union in 1927-28 that was very influential to him. He spent the uh, next three months in the final days of the NEP era. What he found in Moscow and Leningrad was an abundance of cultural life, with chance to meet many of the avant-gardists of the era, not just in fine arts, but in music, theater, and film. He met Sergei Eisenstein, who had a profound impact on Barr, as he later inaugurated film library at MoMA in the 1930s. He regarded this trip as the most wonderful experience of my life, despite the difficulties he faced there. Yet, he was forced to stay away from the Soviet Union for almost 30 years. But as soon as it turned out that he had a chance to renew his contacts, he immediately jumped to the occasion, becoming electrified by the prospects of Soviet opening to the world. In his 1928 trip, he had also tried to see art collections confiscated from Ser Sergei Shukin and Ivan Morozov, boasting especially early 20th century French and Russian masterpieces remaining hidden from sight in Soviet museums still in the 1950s. This was his first thought when he was contacted by a New York lawyer called Marshall McDuffie in late 1954. This McDuffie had been among the first non-communist Westerners to reach out to Soviet leadership after Stalin's death. Using his wartime connections, he got Khrushchev's personal invitation to the Soviet Union, also doing a three-hour private interview with Khrushchev. As he was planning his second trip in late 1954, he contacted Barr with an unexpected offer. He alleged to have been contacted by a counselor in the Soviet embassy in Washington about possible sale of some modern paintings. This vague remark was considered to refer to the very collections of Ivan Marozov and Sergei Shukin that included some of the finest works by Picasso, Monet, Van Gogh, Cezanne, Gauguin, and many others. Barr was enthusiastic about the chance. He recalled that in the 1930s, Andrew Mellon had bought several notable paintings from the cash-trapped Soviet government, and Barr thought this might be a second such chance. 
Officially, Moman declined to be involved, but allowed Barr to act on behalf of unnamed American patrons. McDuffie went on with the negotiation, but nothing came out of it in the end. Khrushchev was said to have given a flat turn down for the proposal. Although paintings had been kept in museum basements for decades, Soviets had no intention whatsoever to sell them. In fact, a few years later, Yuri Zhukov announced in New York Herald Tribune rather theatrically that the Soviet Union would even buy back the paintings that were sold to the United States in the 1930s. But important result from McDuffie affair was that Barr's attention turned to the Soviet Union for several years to come, and he spent considerable amount of his energy for dealings with his Soviet colleagues. Barr dropped the idea of buying early modern masterpieces and st instead started to sound Soviet officials about the chance to loan some of them to exhibitions in MoMA and other US art museums. However, in 1955, US government was still highly suspicious about Soviet aims at cultural exchange and was hesitant to accept offers for official agreement. But MoMA was a private institution, and thus they took the matter straightly to Soviet ambassador, successfully pushing the matter forward. For Barr, the first logical step was to finally see the paintings in person. Soon after approaching Soviet embassy, Barr received a notice that the Soviet Ministry of Culture had sent an official request to Soviet bureaucracy about an official exchange of paintings between the US and the USSR. Then, Barr was invited to travel with his colleague to the Soviet Union to further the exchange project. In Moscow, this, this was uh, in June 1956, they were treated as royals. But more importantly, Barr was finally allowed into museum storeroom where he saw Kandinsky's Malevich and other paintings hidden from public almost uh, for four decades. Barr's experience from the Soviet Union were very encouraging. In his letter from Moscow, Barr was very positive about the project and said it that there was, this is a direct quote, better than 50-50 chance of success, end of quote. After Barr's trip uh, to the Soviet Union for almost three decades, it seems that he might be able to pull off a revolutionary exhibition displaying hidden masterpieces from the Soviet collections. Soviets, in turn, would get an exhibition of 19th century American realist paintings and the famous Family of Man photo exhibition from MoMA. Formal Soviet approval for the exchange came in summer 1956. The fact that Barr and MoMA wished to avoid canonized Soviet era paintings was no wonder, but surprising here is that, uh, that Impressionism was at all emphasized in connection with the exchange. After all, Impressionism had been equaled with formalism only a few years earlier in the Soviet Union. Now, museum professionals were openly considering exchange of Impressionist art with the United States, an obvious manifestation of their reformist approach, even if Soviets were carefully selecting realist and less modern works from the list of American art in the negotiations. Visits of Soviet art museum professionals to the US took place in October and November 1956. The main meeting took place on November th uh, 3rd of November when directors of Tretyakov Gallery and Pushkin Art Museum together with uh, Tamara Mamedova from the Soviet Embassy met with MoMA staff, added with representatives from Yale University Arts Gallery, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Art Institute of Chicago. These museums and institutes added with San Francisco Museum of Art, an undefined museum in the Soviet Union, were supposed to participate in the exchanges. Plan was to have a uh, hundred to hundred and twenty paintings tour for one year in both countries. Preliminary agreement was already rather detailed, stating how paintings would be packaged and transported, ranging from travel arrangements of accompanying personnel to ascertaining of possible damages to paintings. Key person in the Soviet side was Tamara Mamedova, cultural attaché from the Soviet embassy in the US, who also represented soon to be terminated Vox. While idea of the exchange had come up uh, under Mamedova's predecessor, Yuri Gauk, Barr had been quite suspicious about Gauk. In Barr's opinion, Gauk was, um, this is a direct quote, was trying to maneuver us into a position where we would be showing Soviet socialist realism in MoMA, end of quote. Things changed when conservative-minded Gauk was replaced by apparently more liberal Mamedova. Furthermore, instead of merely accepting Barr's suggestion of arts exchange, she was ready to expand it. She asked MoMA for loans from their film library, 
but also adding family of man to the exchange plan. Barr had also a specific petition to add for the Soviets. He was, uh, he was arranging a major Picasso 75th anniversary exhibition at MoMA for 1957, and for this purpose he attempted to get hidden Picassos from the Soviet collections to MoMA. Soviets did not seem to have anything against loaning the Picassos, and this project proceeded along the more extensive U.S.-Soviet art exhibition exchange. But unexpected twist in the lot took place as merely hours after the meeting at MoMA concluded, Soviet forces invaded Hungary, complicating things drastically. International politics influenced early projects of East-West cultural exchange, perhaps more than later on when exchange became more commonplace. But it was not only Soviet actions that were influential. Already before the Hungarian Revolution in autumn 1956, U.S. State Department had been very cautious about cultural exchanges with the Soviet Union. It was impossible to avoid State Department's involvement in projects related to the Soviet Union. Visas for Soviet visitors, for example, depended on the department. Furthermore, in 1956, Secretary of State was John Forster Dulles, known for his hard stance against communism. Accordingly, State Department seems to have adopted very cautious attitude towards the Soviet Union, even in cultural issues. Thus, when Soviets were preparing for the reciprocal visit in summer 1956, MoMA and its staff had to provide a number of times the department with details about the Soviet visit, its nature and the itinerary, and MoMA also provided the State Department with updates and memorandums of all the con uh, conversations with the Soviets. Although State Department was perhaps rightfully wary of Soviet objectives until Soviet cultural attaché Gauk was abruptly called home in late summer 1956, Tamara Mamedova did not evoke any more confidence in the department. MoMA and Barr, however, very quickly developed friendly and confident ties with Mamedova. Barr was hardly informed about power changes within the Soviet administration, although he immediately made a difference between Mamedova and Gauk, whom he had considered stiff and bureaucratic. For State Department, Mamedova was a representative of the Soviet government and the Communist Party, and therefore unreliable. Illustratively, State Department tried to prevent Mamedova from joining the U.S. tour of Soviet museum professionals Alexander Zamoshkin and Polikarp Lebedev as they arrived to the United States. State Department was convinced that Mamedova would act as an ideological filter without which Soviet visitors would be more susceptible to American messages. This perception was rather naive and uninformed. Lebedev, director of Tretyakov Gallery, had been a highly placed party apparatchik under Stalin. Mamedova, in turn, received her prominent position only under Khrushchev. Indeed, in Barr's view, Mamedova was willing to discuss American and Soviet views on art, aiming at understanding U.S. viewpoints on art. Mamedova visited MoMA informally several times to discuss with Barr and his associates about art and cultural exchanges in general. Barr himself was hardly naive, but contrary to the State Department, he, he's, he seems to have made a difference between the party line and Soviet bureaucrats, seeing certain individuals as human beings with personal interests. Meanwhile, State Department's role in the exchange projects had been so far to stay in the background, but Hungarian events highlighted its role. State Department staff openly urged MoMA to curtail exchange projects for the moment. Yet, unofficially, they were ready to let Barr to proceed with negotiation about Picasso loans. Yet, Department's approach seems to have affected both MoMA's willingness to take the project further and generally the chances of its success greatly. It seems that for MoMA, State Department and the government were two important partners to be angered, even if Barr was personally for the exchange with the Soviets. As a compromise, while the exchange of exhibitions was postponed for the moment, Barr went on with attempting to secure Picasso loans from the Soviet Union for the spring 1957, since U.S. State Department seemed to have nothing against this line of action. Picasso loans, however, revealed the big issue in the negotiations that concerned practically all the art exchanges from the Soviet Union dealing with pre-revolutionary art. Soviet Union wanted official guarantees that loaned pictures would be returned despite possible legal suits. In 1954, there had been a confrontation in Paris with heir of Sergei Shukin, Irene, who urged that the paintings should not be returned to the Soviet Union. 
After this event, Soviet officials had been wary of moving these paintings anywhere. Quite early on, Barr realized that some kind of guarantees would be necessary in order to get paintings from the Soviet Union. State Department's early, although not official or final stand on the issue, was that since the Soviet Union was a sovereign state, recognized as such by the United States, ownership of Russian property should not, should not be a problem when in the United States. In practice, Barr went, went to great pains to secure the loans. He even had Picasso himself to write to the Soviet Minister of Culture. The problem, however, remained. Soviets demanded guarantees and the US government was unwilling to give any. In Barr's opinion, Soviets were ready to come halfway by accepting non-binding US guarantees, but State Department was unyielding. Barr wondered, direct quote, whether the State Department is our master or our servant, end of quote. Thus, without guarantees, Picasso were not to be sent to MoMA, and thus its anniversary exhibition was held without Soviet loans. Still, even with failed Picasso exchange, there was still the major exchange project for which the political climate seemed to be finally getting better along 1957. What was going to be exchanged then? In the spirit of reciprocity, Soviets would send late 19th century and early 20th century French and Russian, preferably impressionist paintings. Americans, in turn, would send American realist paintings from the same era. Framework, uh, framework uh, and quite detailed plans were settled at MoMA already in November uh, 1956. Both Soviet and American museum professionals were confident that this was going to be only the first such exchange with several similar projects following in the future. In practice, on the American side, it was Barr who went through the Soviet catalog, deciding and proposing which paintings would be accepted by Americans as part of the exchange. Others seemed happy about his choices. While such exhibition was far from typical for MoMA, Barr likely thought that this was the first step towards more topical exhibitions for MoMA. Barr also took the project as an educational one, considering this occasion a great chance to educate Soviet audiences. This could be seen in the way Barr observed exposing of his Soviet visitors to modern art. Museum directors from the Soviet Union, Zamoshkin and Lebedev, visited MoMA and other museums as part of the 1956 US tour. At MoMA, Barr gave them a personal tour describing their reactions uh, toward the different sections, paintings, and sculptures. In Barr's opinion, both tended value older masterpieces of the contemporary art. Yet, both admired the way in which MoMA hanged and presented works of art, choosing individual surroundings for major works of art, instead of hanging them in similar ways. In Barr's opinion, Zamoshkin was more voluble. Lebedev, in turn, seemed enthusiastic, enthusiastic about Dali. Barr also paid attention how they did not recognize all modern paintings, for example, mistaking Cezanne for Picasso and not recognizing Fernand Leger's and Pierre Mondrian's works. Barr, however, did not question their expertise, only their knowledge of contemporary Western art. In the future, he continued this strategy. He would patiently concentrate in educating his Soviet acquaintances, initiating them to abstract art. Meanwhile, best such chance seemed to be to start exchange of major art exhibitions. Thus, by mid-February 1957, after three months uh, had passed since the Soviet invasion of Hungary, Barr and Tamara Mamedova from the Soviet embassy in Washington con continued with the major project. Mamedova worked particularly hard for the exchange to take place. During spring 1957, Barr was pos more positive about the exchange than ever. The main problem, however, was still guarantees. In June and July, Barr exchanged several letters with Soviet ambassador Zarubin about guarantees for paintings, trying to assure Soviets that paintings would find their way back to the Soviet Union even without official US guarantees. Soviet department's delay tactics and sore attitude made the work difficult, however. By the summer 1957, it was admitted in international discussions of MoMA that chances for the exchange started to look very dim. Mamedova quoted Soviet Minister of Culture Nikolai Mikhailov saying no to exchanges because, a quote, he does not wish to get into trouble because he would lose half his head, end of quote, if something happened to paintings. The only remaining obstacle in the negotiation was the issue of US guarantees. 
dead end in the negotiation, looks very odd in the situation when Soviet and American governments were starting their negotiation about US-Soviet agreement on cultural exchanges that was concluded by January 1958. This agreement led, for example, to the famous American exhibition in Moscow, Sokolniki, in 1959. Still, exchange project was buried and was realized only five years after Barr's death in 1986. Even then, it was not MoMA, but the National Gallery of Art, under the patronage of 88-year-old industrialist Armand Hammer, that fulfilled Barr's dream. Furthermore, Impressionist and post-impressionist paintings from Leningrad Hermitage and Moscow's Pushkin Museum, precisely the ones Barr had tried to reach. Tens of paintings from Matti, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, and Picasso were included in this exchange. In 1986, the US government had finally given formal guarantees that paintings would be returned to the Soviet Union. This apparently gave the Soviet Union enough confidence to finally proceed with the Soviet-American ex exhibition exchange. This incident is illustrative about the early exchanges in art. Different levels of officials in both sides contradicted each other, and few poorly chosen words could obliterate the whole effort. But as things at the governmental level stalled, personal ties developed, as Barr's case well illustrates. He did not channel his frustration about failed exchange projects towards his Soviet colleagues, quite the opposite. In Barr's mind, failure in exchange of exhibitions was due to government policies. He seemed rather cold towards the State Department in their actions and was much more cordial in his correspondence with individuals. Even with the exchange project proceeding slowly, he acquired a strategy of courting Soviet museum people patiently. This proved fruitful in the future. He understood that many of his Soviet colleagues were hungry for contacts with the West. Thus, he answered letters that started, started to pour soon after his 1956 visit, and he also sent books, books not to individuals as he was cautious, but to libraries of their respective institutes. So he distributed books too, as you see. Consequently, he carefully built a network with Soviet art museums and art professionals. While Barr's visit, uh, first visit, um, in the post-Second World War to the Soviet Union in 1956 was obviously connected to the Soviet-American Art Exhibition Exchange, the second chance he took to travel there had hardly anything to do with this project. Rather, this time his travel was about expanding his contacts and possibly about his desire to challenge the Soviet audience about their views on art. His motives are not completely clear, but as we examine the trip and its surroundings, education indeed seems a prominent motive. Before his arrival, a heavily illustrated manifesto on modern art was published in America, U.S. Information Agency's Russian language magazine. There, Barr carefully placed examples of modern art from all around the world, not forgetting anti-fascist paintings in order to make it as viable as possible for a Soviet reader. And yet, his visit was certainly not only about propaganda for the US government, nor for the modern art. Mamedova worked particularly hard to realize Barr's second trip to the Soviet Union, which, which, which was not without problems. She was also behind the idea of having Barr to lecture in the Soviet Union. It also appears that the head of GKKS, Yuri Zhukov, was very eager to realize Barr's visit. According to Barr, Zhukov had expressed his wish that Barr would lecture informally before university, museum, and art, um, artist audiences, end of quote. Zhukov had also suggested Barr to take color slides with him in order to present artwork, as well as film documentaries of American artists with him for lectures, something he eventually did. Barr's visit started early on June 1959. The State Department did not put a cent to Barr's trip, failing to see its value, but it was sponsored by the Soviet government, MoMA, and Barr personally. In his three-week tour of the Soviet Union, he and his wife lectured in Moscow, Leningrad, Tbilisi, and Yerevan, meeting museum people. He was embraced enthusiastically. For instance, he was supposed to lecture in Leningrad Eremitage only for the museum staff, which he did but he was immediately asked to repeat his lecture the next day, and then the hall was jam-packed with enthusiastic people. After similar appearances in Tbilisi and Yerevan, he was summoned back to Moscow, where he was admonished for the tone of his lectures. 
Apparently, he had been a bit too popular. Yet, after his trip, he received a number of letters of gratitude, and he patiently answered each and every one. Barr's visit was most likely made him not only among... Uh, made him not only known among the Soviet artistic intelligentsia, but also some kind of an authoritative voice when it came to abstract art. This can be deduced from the reaction to his book, What is Modern Painting, uh, 1956 edition, which he usually gave to all Soviet visitors to MoMA, in connection with a tour in which he patiently introduced MoMA's modern art collections. Following one such occasion in 1961, Literaturnaya Gazeta, the leading Soviet cultural magazine, published an attack directed against Barr. Like Barr later found out, attack was carried out by a high-placed agit profit official, uh, Romanov, rather, the, the, rather than by a member of Soviet artistic intelligentsia. This was something Barr took very personally, and he arranged U.S. art magazine Art News to have Romanov's article translated into English and prepared an answer for the same issue, commenting on the accusations. He naturally sent his article to various people in the Soviet Union, but this hardly aroused any further commenting. Even if Barr indeed was personally anti-Soviet, then he made very clear distinction between the system and the people. Especially after his second Soviet trip, he readily welcomed Soviet travelers to MoMA. If we could not himself tour them around the museum, he at least took a chance to ch uh, change a few words with his visitors, handing them copies of what is modern art. He also admitted that sometimes he spoke his visitors over to admit that Soviet public would hardly be harmed by seeing a few Kandinsky's. Soviet visitors in turn, in, in turn, according to Barr, usually admitted that Soviet public would need to be gradually exposed to modern art. For some visitors like Yevgeny Yevtushenko, Barr had much more time. When Yevtushenko visited MoMA in 1966, Barr spent four hours discussing with him. Barr was also ready to share his network with other people too. Especially after his 1959 visit, Barr regularly wrote letters of recommendation and introductions to a number of his colleagues traveling to the Soviet Union. If someone with interest uh, towards the arts was going to Moscow and Leningrad, Barr wrote the local museum stuff about giving the designated people access to paintings and collections that were hidden from the broader public. At first, Barr appealed for certain persons being important for MoMA, like when prestigious patron and donor of MoMA, Louis Smith, was about to travel to Moscow. Later on, however, Barr would only refer to people as his personal friends or colleagues, not so much to MoMA. Quite often, this was enough to open doors. When Hilton Kramer, New York Times critic, was visiting the Soviet Union in 1967, he was supposed to interview Eremitage's director. Upon his arrival to the museum with interpreters, he was told that the director was away. Only after 20 minutes of heated conversation came a point when he mentioned Alfred Barr's name, and this changed everything. The tone changed, and five minutes later, the director appeared, and the interview went very smoothly. This story of how East-West art exchanges were planned in the immediate post-Stalin period, how new openings of the kind that took place in the field of classical music and dance, for example, seemed to be at hand in the field of fine arts, too. In music, individual artists, orchestras, choirs, even opera houses made travels of the Iron Curtain. Composers' delegation traveled both directions and also met at international festivals, discussing recent artistic currents and uh, changed opinions. In fine arts, development seems to have been much slower. Attempts at wide-scale exchange of exhibition faced a seemingly impenetrable wall of bureaucracy in both sides. U.S. government abstained from giving any kind of guarantees for the Soviets, although it would have been against U.S. constitution to give legally binding guarantees against lawsuits, Soviets would have been satisfied with the symbolic guarantees that would have saved the Soviet Union from negative publicity in the face of a private lawsuit. This controversy seems to have prevented all attempts uh, at, an art, uh, at an exchange of exhibition of revolutionary art. Curiously enough, this was not an obstacle in Europe, although even in Europe, movement of works of art was small when compared to music or dance. Similarity between music and art was apparent, however, in the way how Soviets preferred private individuals as brokers in art exchanges. Alfred Barr and the private museum he represented New York's Museum of Modern Art were precisely what the Soviets were looking for 
highly skilled partners that were able to deliver. Yet, a number of factors prevented fruitful cooperation in this particular field. Another important finding from this case was the role of individuals. Much depended on the activity of individual actors and their motivation. It is important to notice also that even if mutual, mutual projects fell through and common objective in this sense was lost, many of the connections stayed alive. In, in the case of Barr, failure to exchange works of art was only the beginning. Instead of abandoning his Soviet contacts that seemed unable to further their common project, Barr decided to deepen his connections and transformed factual ties into transnational networks. While the Soviet government originally chose Barr and MoMA as partners who could further Soviet foreign policy objectives in the United States, Barr's second trip to the Soviet Union and his following correspondence with Soviets had hardly anything to do with the government, governmental level. Instead, these ties were about personal and professional motivation on both sides. They were networks between equals, people with similar interests. This was certainly a step towards normal relations between two different countries and cultures, aiming at mutual understanding. Cold War narrative has often failed to see existence of such connections, but even if political realities limited the amount and contents of such networks, it does not mean that they never existed, as Barr's exam example points out. However, in order to understand the extent and implications of these transnational networks in the field of art, there is definitely a need for further studies. Barr's case was only the beginning, taking place during the early period of international opening of the Soviet Union. After Barr, transnational networks expanded, calling for more research on the issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> you told us about an um, interesting exchange exhibition project uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union that didn't come alive. Um, how would you eva evaluate um, which side uh, are more to blame for this? Or was there, or was there really mutual stubbornness and unwi unwillingness to cooperate from both sides? Yeah. Well, um, at the governmental level, I think that um, <laughs> it was on both sides. I mean, you, you cannot blame either governments for the, for the failure, I think, because it was as stubborn as, as US government was to give any kind of guarantees, I think the Soviet government was, was as stubborn in demanding these guarantees and so on. So I, 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 I don't know, I, I haven't looked that deep into this, um, this governmental level, really. I just, it, it just seems that in, well, in this presentation and paper, I'm, I'm looking at things from the bar's point of view. And he was blaming uh, state, uh, U.S. State Department, but of course that was, um, I mean, the organ he was closer to. I mean, he, he, was, he wasn't in the position uh, to estimate what happened in the Soviet administration. Of course, it, it, it would probably be very much different if you look at it from the point of view of the Maramamedova, for example. But I, I, would, I would estimate that it was the failure in both sides in the governmental level. Thank you. Simo, I wanted to ask about your sources. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the thing is that um, I've been looking forward to going to Moscow. So I, I don't have much of the uh, Russian side here at this paper. So these, these materials come, come mostly from the Archives of American Arts, uh, Museum of Modern Art Collection. So they have a very extensive uh, archive of Alfred H. Barr's correspondence, his memorandum, stuff like that. So it's, this paper is mostly from the MoMA archives. Yes, there are things from here and there, and uh, I've been doing a lot of... My usual place of research is really in Moscow, so there are some traces here and there that I've been, I've been finding um, before I, I, I had any, any idea of this paper. But I'm actually looking forward to going to Moscow and see what they have on this, if, 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 if I can find some, some papers related to Mamedova and so on. But this is from the US point of view, really, and Barr, personally. But are the uh, Russian archives uh, available to you? Well, yeah, I, I mean, that's... Uh, because here we have actually arts exchange, so it's in the, mostly in the Air Gully, which is the um, arts archive in Moscow. So it's, it's quite open. I mean, it's, I, I've never had any kind of problems there. It's, it's, um, the thing is that it's not so political, so they haven't really put any, any uh, 
restrictions, at least not that I would have encountered at any point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Carsten Brüggemann, representing Tallinn University. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation, and you especially underlined the role of individuals mm. Um, mm. on the example of, of Bar. Do you see anybody on the other side, on the Soviet side, that would, on this personal level, somehow match the, the influence Bar had? Well, of course, when, when I'm looking things from the, I mean, from Bar's correspondence, I mean that so there are these couple of people like Tamara Mamedova who seem to be very, very active. I mean, but the thing is that it's, it's, it's very hard to find a, um, correspondence of these people in the Soviet side. I mean, in the, in the archives uh, in Moscow, you, you mostly have this official stuff. Of course, there is official correspondence and so on, but it's not very useful in the sense that it's, it's always um, partly censored. And I mean, for example, Mamedova used phone. I mean, you can, Barr wrote everything down. When, when Tamara Mamedova phoned Alfred Barr, he wrote a memo about that. Mamedova was using phone just because he didn't have to write it down because then it would have been, I mean, censored and, and they would have known what Mamedova has been doing with Barr and so on, so she was using the phone. Um, but I mean that there's, there's a lot of correspondence in, the, in, in, in Barr's uh, archives with, with um, his Soviet counterparts and especially in the beginning it's quite official what comes from the Soviet side, so they are not how to say, they are very formal. But later on, along the 1960s, it's, it becomes more cordial. I mean, they, they, they write to each other just using the first names and so on. It becomes much more relaxed in a way. But I think the problem is that how, how to find, I mean, this, this more personal correspondence from the Soviet side. I, I, I haven't really, um, I don't have a solution yet. I think it, it would be great to find, I mean, these people and interview them. I, I think that would be a, a proper way to, I mean, approach these, these networks from the Soviet side, to interview people or find, I mean, oral history on the subject. But I don't have a clue yet how to do that. I would be happy of any, any hints you may have. And my question is, uh, during the uh, visits to the Soviet Union, uh, uh, had Barr the chances to visit, to visit uh, workshops of modern, uh, of uh, the artists uh, who work in the Soviet Union? And especially, I mean, uh, did uh, he, had, he have contacts uh, with the uh, underground artists? Mm. And later on, in the 70s, when the emigration from the Soviet Union started, and many underground artists left the mm. country. So were there some contacts between mm. Bar and MoMA itself and with this uh, kind of artists? Yeah. So thank you for the question. Uh, as far as I know, Bar didn't uh, um, have a chance to meet any underground artists in, in 1959, or, or at least he didn't mention any. Um, and that was actually his last trip to the Soviet Union anyway. Um, in the 1970s, he, I mean, he wasn't active anymore in MoMA. He was already retired and, and died in 1981. But for example, when he met Yevgeny Yevtushenko in 1966, uh, he, he uh, mentions uh, talking about uh, underground artists with Yevtushenko and that uh, Yevtushenko was proposing that Barr could take to MoMA some, some I mean, um, some works of the Soviet kind of, um, I'm not sure if it was underground artists, but he mentioned some names here and there. I'm not an expert, so I, I, I cannot tell. But um, that he could take to MoMA some examples. But Barr was very strict actually on this one, that uh, the works of art he takes to MoMA, they need to be very high, I mean, of, of high standard, and he wouldn't take anything, and not, not just based on some talk with her, even if it was Yevtushenko. So, but I, I don't ha actually have too much information about his contacts with, with underground artists. Um, I would happy to look into that, but haven't had the chance really. Yeah. 